around my story. I don't really like Indian movies because the actors are always overreacting and the movies are not logical at all. But this is just my personal opinion. However, I've discovered that there are stories stranger than Indian movies. Let me give you a real life example. I'll tell you a story about a young woman named Samantha. Samantha was a beautiful girl with blonde hair and green eyes. She lived with her grandmother after her parents died in a horrible car accident. The whole country read about it. She had many friends, and all the neighbors liked her. They considered her the most beautiful girl in town. Many had proposed to her, but she didn't care much for them. One day, Samantha was walking alone down the street after visiting one of her friends. Suddenly, she had an eerie feeling that someone was following her. She began running and crying for help. Her follower began running and stopped her. He was an ugly man, pointing a knife in her direction. He asked her to hand over her purse. She threw it at him and made a run for it. The man said wait and made to stop her, but another man appeared out of nowhere and punched the thief, who fell unconscious. The brave and good Samaritan picked up Samantha's purse and handed it to her. He was very handsome, with green eyes, soft hair, and an amazing smile. He escorted her back home, and she felt that he was her knight in shining armor. She went inside and hugged her grandmother tight, who was a little surprised but smiled. Samantha was so happy that she gently pulled her grandmother to her feet, and they whirled around and danced playfully. The very next day, she was surprised when she answered the doorbell. Steve, the tall, handsome man, was standing there, holding flowers. He proposed to her, and she said yes. Thus began their love story. Then one day, Samantha was standing in the kitchen preparing dinner. Steve and her grandmother were out, but they were supposed to be back soon. Samantha had everything ready, and she set the table. The house door opened, and Steve walked in. Samantha went to greet him, but she felt dizzy and fainted. Steve quickly took her to the hospital. The doctor congratulated Steve, saying that he was going to be a father. Steve was ecstatic, but Samantha was not. Instead, she was shocked and nervous. She said that she was too young to have kids, that she wasn't ready to be a mother. Steve was taken aback and said, But why? Don't you want him? Things were different from that point on. Samantha tried to get an abortion several times, but Steve was always stopping her. She couldn't accept it. She blamed Steve, but Steve couldn't understand her. In her seventh month of pregnancy, Samantha was with her grandmother at the supermarket when she saw a small boy run onto the road. Fearing he might get run over by a car, Samantha quickly pulled the boy off the road to safety. The boy's mother saw what happened and thanked Samantha, feeling so grateful and relieved. Samantha was crying at the moment and replied, No need to thank me. I'm going to be a mother like you soon. For the first time, she was beginning to feel real affection for the baby. Forgive me, she silently thought to herself. She tried to contact Steve many times to tell him that she had finally accepted. She was ready to become a mother, but he never responded. Finally, the day had come. Samantha went to the hospital to give birth. After the surgery, she was very tired. Nevertheless, when she woke up, she immediately asked for the baby. Her grandmother handed her the child. It was a daughter, and she was so beautiful. The nurse tried to take the baby out of her arms, but Samantha refused, wanting to hold her for as long as she could. The next day, Samantha heard a big commotion, and she had a feeling of dread that something bad had just happened. It was confirmed when she saw her grandmother's face. She asked what had happened, and her grandmother told her that a child was missing and had apparently been kidnapped. Samantha's pale face slowly pleaded, Please don't tell me that it was my daughter. When her grandmother nodded, Samantha broke down and began crying and wailing in pain. The nurses tried to calm her down, and when she did, her grandmother came over to her and handed her a note. It had been found in her missing daughter's hospital crib. It was in Steve's handwriting. It simply said, If you don't want her, I do. Then Samantha fainted. For many years, she tried finding her baby, but couldn't. Steve and her daughter had vanished into thin air. She felt as if time had stopped for her. But Steve didn't feel that way. He raised their daughter into a beautiful young woman. He named her Margot. Whenever Margot asked about her mother, Steve would always tell her that her mother was dead. But he often told her stories about her mother and how much he had loved her. Margot's intuition, however, 
told her that her father wasn't being completely honest with her and that he was hiding some big dark secret. One day, Steve fell ill unexpectedly. He called Margot to him and told her that he was very sick and felt that he was going to die soon. He said that he wanted to reveal a secret that he had long kept from her, that her mother was actually alive and that her name was Samantha. He told her that he had kidnapped her from the hospital at birth because her mother did not want a child. He regretted it and asked Margot to forgive him. He gave her Samantha's address, and soon after, he died. After his death, Margot decided to go looking for her mother. I am Margot, and I am now standing at my mother's address. At her front door, I cannot predict my mother's reaction when she answers the door, and I introduce myself as her daughter, but I'm going to hug her and tell her that I've missed her for so long. I am addicted to food. I suffer a lot. I need help. I've tried to give up, but I fail every time. Hamburgers. Who can give up eating hamburgers, especially with barbecue sauce? I didn't mind this kind of addiction, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me begin by introducing myself. I am Patricia, 15 years old, living with my parents and my brother. I lead a quiet life. No interests, no hobbies, except for eating, that is. Food is my faithful friend. It never leaves me. It is my partner, my soulmate. But having food as your soulmate has insidious side effects. A dark side, if you will. It denies me a healthy life, robs me of the energy to play, and causes me to sleep excessively. I would much rather stay at home with a bag of potato chips than go out and exercise. My soulmate ultimately betrayed me, though, last Thanksgiving at my granny's home. She lives in a state nearby. Granny was a clever doctor and an excellent cook at that. She could conjure up something really delicious. On that day, she had prepared barbecue turkey with nuts and other secret recipe ingredients. The taste was so great, as if it had descended from heaven itself. I felt like I was fighting a food war, and I had to win at all costs. I ate and ate and ate. I don't know why, but I just couldn't control myself. I attacked that turkey like it was the last on the planet. But every culinary war with a worthy adversary, such as the barbecued turkey, has its own unique type of casualties. Suddenly, I found myself unable to breathe. I fell to my knees and passed out. The turkey had won. I woke up later in the hospital, though, still clinging to an unfinished turkey leg. The doctor told me that I was gaining way too much weight. He said that I should be put on a diet. Diet? Man, how I hated that word. It hung over my head like the Sword of Democles. It meant depriving me of my passion, my reason for living. I considered eating vegetables in small amounts to be the worst form of cruel and unusual punishment, the worst form of torture imaginable. Imagine thinking of a wonderful, greasy, cheese-laden pizza with all the toppings and then suddenly opening your eyes to find a healthy green salad bowl. But I had reached a turning point in life. One day, my brother was playing on the street. While I was sitting at home, gazing longingly at a tempting piece of cheesecake, just sitting there, taunting, daring me to eat it, I struggled mightily to resist the urge. But in the end, I succumbed and wolfed it down like a starving animal. Shortly afterwards, I began feeling dizzy, but I was unable to call for help this time. And then I passed out again. I was taken to the hospital. While lying in the hospital bed, half conscious, I overheard the doctor say to someone, she needs to stop eating or it will be the death of her. I thought to myself, whoa, death? So I made up my mind right then, right there. I resolved to fight a new war, a war against my appetite. On our way back home, I told my father that I wanted to see a nutritionist. He was delighted to hear that. Later, at the clinic, the doctor welcomed us in. She told me how to overcome my eating fetish. She gave me a strict diet regimen with a schedule full of healthy meals. I kept telling myself that winning this war was possible. I simply had to be patient and persevere. I stuck to the strict diet and did some physical workouts. My parents supported me wholeheartedly. I was enthusiastic. I can totally do this. A week passed quickly and I eagerly visited the doctor to receive some good news. When the doctor weighed me and told me that my weight hadn't changed at all, I was crestfallen. She looked at me and asked me, how was this possible? 
I told her I didn't know because I was following her diet thoroughly, though it did require a tremendous effort on my part. Another week passed, and again I went to the doctor. The results were the same. She said to me, Patricia, are you sure you're following the diet I prescribed for you? I said yes. She sat there wondering. Then she told me with a puzzled look on her face, It's odd, but your weight is increasing, not decreasing. This unexpected piece of news mystified me. Another week passed. No change. The doctor was nonplussed. I returned home with a dejected look on my face. My father asked me what was wrong. And when I told him, he laughed. Do you believe that? My father actually laughed at my predicament. I was furious. He gestured an apology with his hand and then told me that it was my own fault. I was puzzled. What are you talking about? He told me that I had been sleepwalking to the refrigerator every night and eating everything in sight. I was taken aback. I couldn't believe it. Stop acting like he didn't know it, he said. You must have been awake. I replied, no, father, I'm not acting. I was truly unaware that I've been sleepwalking and eating in my sleep. But now that we've finally solved the mystery of the increasing weight, we returned to the doctor with this new information and told her the situation. She laughed and told me that my discipline had denied my body the food it craved, but my brain had refused to cooperate and had overridden my will by urging me to eat in a subconscious state. She told me not to worry, though, that she could treat that. Armed with this knowledge and her support, and the support of my family, I felt that I could finally win this war. My name is Keanu, and I'm 13 years old. I am a psychopath. I freely admit it in front of all of you. I attribute my sickness solely to my father, because any story about a cruel father pales in comparison to my father. He would abuse me physically, mentally, verbally, and emotionally in every given moment. He left no stone unturned in this regard. He would beat me into unconsciousness. He accused me of being the cause of my mother's death, who died during my childbirth. Whenever Dad had any problem at home, he would accuse me of being the cause of it. One time he even beat me at school when my teacher called him to school because I had beat up my classmate who had beaten me up first. I tried to explain to him, but he wouldn't listen and he just beat me even more. One day, it was fun day at school and everyone was supposed to invite their parents to visit the school for party and introduction activities. I chose not to invite my dad. So I was alone at the festivities. I felt envious of all my classmates for having loving parents to have fun with. My teacher noticed me alone, came over and offered to be my parent for the day. I was so happy. We had great fun together. Miss Linda had lost both her husband and her son in a plane crash. Only she had survived. After fun day had passed, Miss Linda showed more interest in me. She would bring me sandwiches and spend time with me during breaks. I thought of her as my mom. 